It's good to be back with you again this week. I must say, I am. <clears throat> my husband is the sports fan, so when I saw people with purple on, I'm like, what's going on? Is it like, <clears throat> the beginning of Lent is not yet, so it's not that. <clears throat> so they straighten me out in the narthex. I'm all, I'm all on board now. The best neighbors my husband John and I ever had lived across the street from us when we lived in Brunswick, Maryland. Their names were Sandy and Mary Sandretsky. His name was not really Sandy, his name was Tom, but you know, he went by Sandy, being the small town that it was, famous for its nicknames. But Sandy and Mary were the first ones I approached when I realized the parsonage oven would not hold, it was so small, it would not hold the Texas sheet cake pan I needed to bake my children's birthday cakes. Long tradition of making them Texas sheet cake. And I'll tell you the way we found out was the day we moved in, or maybe the day after, my mother came over and she was helping unpack the kitchen and then she decided to make cookies and I was in the other room doing stuff and I heard this scream from the kitchen and I went running in, I said, what's wrong? And she goes, the cookie sheet won't fit in the oven. And I'm like, oh, mom, you're just, you know, you've, you've got it going the wrong way. Well, sure enough, the oven was so small, literally. So, so Mary and I, across the street, I had a system. I would call her, and I'd say, Mary, I'm baking a cake today. Can I come over at, like, 2 o'clock? And she'd take my pan, put it in her oven, and we did that for a while. Then I got them to redo the Parsonage kitchen, you know that. The neighbors loved our black lab hunter, watched him every time we went away, spoiled him rotten. Sandy loved to garden. He'd help me with my flowers and even water them when we were gone. They picked up the kids from school a few times. You know how when you take your car for repair, somebody has to bring you back home. They did that a couple times. We tried to reciprocate. I mean, we were a busy family with children and school, so I would, I would make casseroles and homemade wheat rolls. When it snowed a lot, we would help with shoveling. We gave them beach house time in exchange for watching our dog. But honestly, when you weigh the scales of who gave more, I'm sure Sandy and Mary won by a long shot. They were such good neighbors. Now, it's funny, the word neighbor. I mean, you do realize this word has been around a long, long time, since Bible times. I did a Bible gateway search, and one of the earliest times it's used in the Bible is a passage in Exodus where instructions are given for monthly meals with lamb, all right? The passage says, if any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there that live in that other house. So there you go. It's your neighbor. Everyone knows we share with our neighbors. The Ten Commandments, the rules which Moses brought down off the mount to give to the people references our neighbors. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's animals, your neighbor's BMW, your neighbor's new whatever. And of course, many of us are familiar with the use of the word neighbor, which we find in today's gospel lesson. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, like a good neighbor. So the concept of neighbor has been around forever, which I think makes it really interesting when the lawyer in today's story pushes back and asks Jesus the question, so who is my neighbor? Do we really think he didn't know who his neighbor was? Or was he just stalling for time? Because Jesus had asked of him a hard thing. So the scripture goes, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus, saying, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, what does it say in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer answers with the verse we just talked about. You shall love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus responds, you have given the right answer. Now do this and you will live. In other words, Jesus says, don't just tell me what you know the law is. I want you to actually do it, to model the law and the love for God and neighbor, and then you'll inherit eternal life. That's what that means. And that's when the lawyer says, who is my neighbor? Do we really think he didn't know 
who his neighbor was, or was he just stalling for time? Because Jesus had asked him to love his neighbor. Now, you can imagine in 30 years of ministry, I have preached on the Good Samaritan many, many times. And chances are, if you've been coming to church or in any kind of Bible study, you're fairly familiar with this story. It's, it's a good old story. I mean, we actually use the phrase Good Samaritan out in the real world. People know what it means. But this is where it comes from, folks. This lesson in the Gospel of Luke, in the Gospels, in the Bible. And in all my years of preaching, I, I had never really unpacked this prelude to the story of the Good Samaritan. This question from the lawyer and Jesus' response, which is all about our neighbor. The lawyer claims to not know who his neighbor is, and so Jesus spells it out with the story of the Good Samaritan. A man left for dead by the side of the road, and the people who chose to help and the people who walked on by. So this morning, I want us to look at the things that made this story so shocking in its time, so surprising when Jesus first told this story, all the while remembering that this started with a call from Jesus to love our neighbors. In one of the commentaries I read as I got ready to write this sermon, it said, when the people listening to Jesus tell this story, and when the readers of the early scriptures heard this story for the first time, it was almost like hearing one of those jokes that starts, a lawyer, a doctor, and a priest walk into a bar, okay? They're, they're kind of, as he starts to tell the story, they think they know what he's going to say. You get ready for a certain outcome. Only the people listening thought that he was going to say a priest, a Levite, and an Israelite were walking down the road. They happened to come upon a man by the side of the road who was badly beaten, but no, that's not what Jesus says. That's not how the story goes. The people listening to this story are expecting Jesus to say an Israelite was the man who helped the man by the side of the road. But no, Jesus says a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan? This is shocking to the listeners. You've got to be wrong, they're thinking. Samaritans are good for nothing, that's what they're thinking. Jesus, you've got the story wrong. Their lawyer's question about the neighbor and Jesus' response with the Good Samaritan mean nothing unless we understand the relationship that existed between the Israelites and the Samaritans in that time. And it was awful. They were, they were enemies. They were deadlocked in a history of strife and hatred. Samaritans were descendants of a mixed race, and they were the people who occupied Israel following the conquest by Assyria. So they were always considered enemies. They opposed rebuilding the temple. They opposed rebuilding Jerusalem. In fact, they constructed, the Samaritans constructed their own place of worship elsewhere. They were viewed as the very opposite of the priest and the Levite in this parable. And the Samaritan was considered ceremonially unclean, which was a big deal for the Israelites. So hear this story again, and imagine the surprise of the, of the lawyer and all the people listening when Jesus answers the who is my neighbor question by telling a story that lifts up their enemy. Because that's what Jesus did. He said, this, this tribe of people you don't trust, that person you have hated, they are acting as a neighbor should act to the person lying in the ditch. And the people you usually look up to the priest and the Levite, they're walking right by. So who's a good neighbor now? Now, friends, when we hear this story in 2024, we have to ask ourselves to get the full impact. We have to ask ourselves, who would be our modern-day Samaritans? Who are the people we don't trust? The enemies of our country. Would it be Putin and his mercenaries in invading Ukraine? Would it be the young folks who shoot up our schools, our nightclubs, our houses of worship? Or let's bring it even closer to home. Are our modern-day Samaritans the folks we don't know? They make us nervous. 
We don't recognize them. What are they doing in our neighborhood anyway? People who are not like us at all. The shock of this story to those who heard it the first time and to us as well is that Jesus wipes away our stereotypes. That's what this story is about, stereotypes. He wipes away our stereotypes of good neighbors and good Christians and good people and says essentially it's not what you say, it's what you do. It's not even who you are. It's how you respond in love like a good neighbor. So you see, the priest and the Levite were tops in their community, pillars of strength and wisdom. And yet when someone was lying on the side of the road in need of help, they walked on by. But the rejected one, the enemy, the mixed race guy walking in the neighborhood where he didn't belong, he's the one who stopped and cared for the man by the side of the road. In this story, Jesus challenges all of our tendencies to, to categorize, to put people into boxes, to set up boundaries, boundaries of race and religion and region and class and sexual orientation. It all means nothing, he says. Your stereotypes mean nothing. Your categories mean nothing if there is no love. And so at the end of the story, Jesus turns to the lawyer and says, which of these three was a neighbor to the man in the ditch? And the lawyer, I mean, he's blown away. He looks down at his feet, he shuffles, and he says, the one who showed mercy. The one who showed mercy. The one who acted out of compassion. The one who didn't let the walls dividing us divide him. That's a good neighbor, Jesus says. There's an old proverb, Arab proverb, which says, to have a good neighbor, you must be one. So have you ever had this kind of experience happen to you like happened to the lawyer that day? where you have pretty much figured out what the deal is, who the hero is, or how a story should end, or what the moral really is, and then you find the exact opposite is true. Well, it happened to me a long, long time ago. I was in my first career managing a fabric store in downtown DC near 18th and M, DuPont Circle, House of Fine Fabrics. And there were homeless people in the city, of course, I actually watched a woman go from being brand new on the streets with her pristine, clean suitcases to a few months later having nothing left to show for it, totally homeless. But there was a man who would come into our store from time to time, a Native American man who came in to buy beads and embroidery floss and big pieces of, of fabric, wool fabric usually, and he would make these beautiful capes that he wore. And I knew he was homeless. I'd seen him on the streets. I'd pretty much put him into a box in my mind of, you know, people who are not to be trusted. So one day he showed up with traveler's checks and he had lots of them and, and he wanted to use them to pay for this big pile of fabric that I had cut for him. And I was suspicious. Where did he get these traveler's checks if he was living on the streets? So I went into the back office and I called the bank. And this was the days when you called the bank and they actually answered the phone. You got a human being. And so, and so the, the traveler's checks were from this particular bank and I told them the story and they said, ma'am, if he has the traveler's checks, you can take them, they're, they're good. So I went back out front, took his checks. When it came time to give him the change, I handed him the bills in return, went to bag his items. And I still remember this to this day. He goes, ma'am, my mother always taught me to tell the truth. And I need to tell you, you just gave me back too much change. And with that, I realized I thought he'd given me $200 in traveler's checks, and he'd actually given me $150. And so he handed me back $50, $50 that I'm sure he could have used. But he chose and said to be honest. It was enough to slap me in the face. 
like the lawyer I had categorized and demonized and figured out who was the good person in the room, and boy, was I wrong. God humbled me that day, nearly 40 years ago now. And yet I still remember what it felt like to learn from that man just who a good neighbor was. You have a story like that in your life. A time when you went looking for something or you needed help, and the answer came in a most blessed and unusual way, almost as if God was teaching you a lesson about how to be a good neighbor. I bet we do have stories like that. The truth is, friends, as long as the Bible has been around, God has been asking us and showing us how to be neighbors, how to love others, how to respond with God's love, even in those situations when we would rather not how to set aside our stereotypes and categories for people and simply accept and welcome and love them like the children of God they are. And even though it sounds like the simplest of things to do, you and I know it's not. It's not always easy to love our neighbors. Please don't tell me it's that guy next door with the loud cars and the crazy music. Please don't tell me it's the person in the office next to mine with the with the bigoted stories and the funny looks she gives me. Please don't tell me, God, that my neighbor is the person who makes my life really hard. And then Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan and says, go and do likewise. Build bridges instead of boundaries, he says. Make peace instead of fighting. Bake a pie and make a friend, he says. Let go of the stereotypes we carry around and instead share the love of God like a good neighbor. Thanks be to God. Amen.